What's up, New Hope? I heard you guys are a talkback church. That wasn't good enough. What's up, New Hope? Oh, man. It is so, that's, that really, that still wasn't good enough. <laughs> it is so good to be with you all this morning. Again, my name is Melvin. I have the great privilege of being an associate pastor at Glad Tidings Church in Lake Charles, Louisiana. But over the last 27 years of my life, I have had the great joy, sometimes, Chad, Casey, the great headache, <laughs> but mostly great joy of being Pastor Letitia's older brother. <clears throat> I know y'all wondering if I could sing. I can't sing worth a lick. <laughs> she didn't get it from me. But most of the time when Tisha and I introduce ourselves to people, they're, they're a bit confused. You know, uh, they, they don't quite understand how it works. So I've learned how to simplify it. I simply explain it like this. Look, my parents were black and Asian. I got the black, she got the Asian. <laughs> Let's not complicate this, people. <laughs> <laughs> it's really easy. They, fried chicken, fried rice. <laughs> hey, they good, though. <laughs> it's good together, right? Uh, I got some fried chicken people in the house today. <laughs> fried chicken. Okay, moving on. We're in the house of God. <laughs> I have a word that I believe that the Lord has placed in my heart to share with this body this morning, but before we continue to, to jump right into the Word of God, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't just take a moment to just give honor to whom honor is due. Listen, I'm, a, I'm an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God in Louisiana, and I want you to know, people from all around the state are talking about the move of God that is happening in Eunice, Louisiana, specifically through New Hope Church. And how many of you know none of that would be possible without the obedience and the surrender of your pastors, Pastor Chris and Pastor Megan? Come on, somebody. But we would be remiss to, 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 to not also give honor to your, your associate pastors and pastors on staff. Because listen, not every church has great lead pastors, and you do. Not every church has great lead pastors and a great pastoral staff. So come on, New Hope. Let's give honor to your staff. Praise the Lord. I, I, again, I, I believe that the Lord has a word for you this morning. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 15, that's where we're gonna. That's where we're. That's what we're gonna visit today. Um, we also have notes behind me. What about y'all? Go to church here. <laughs> y'all know what the notes are. <laughs> I'm like talking like, okay, moving on. Luke chapter 15. Uh, I want to give you a little context real briefly before we jump right in. Luke chapter 15 begins in verse 1. Today we're going to review verse 11 through 24, but, but Luke chapter 15 starts with verse 1. With the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law criticizing Jesus because he's hanging out with sinners. Like, what is he doing hanging out with sinners? What is he doing eating with sinners? Because they truly did not understand God's heart. And so Jesus, in response to their reaction, tells of three parables. He tells of the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost son. He talks of the lost sheep, saying how a, a, a man had 99 sheep, but one got lost. And so he left, I'm sorry, 100 sheep, but one got lost. He left the 99 and went after one. And when he found them, he rejoiced. And then next he talked about the coin. How a lady had 10 coins. This was really more than coins. It was more like a family heirloom. Think of your, your, your great-great-grandmother's wedding ring passed down from generation to generation. And it says that she lost this valuable thing, and she searched the house everywhere, up, turned, flipped it upside down until she found this coin. And when she found it, the Bible says there was great rejoicing. And so today, we're going to pick up with the third parable that Jesus tells, and that's from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. I want to read that to you real briefly, and then we'll pray and get started. Verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger son, the younger one said to his father, Father, 
Give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. By the way, this young man asking for his inheritance before his dad's passing was a great offense. It was a great insult. It was almost saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. But verse 13 continues. It says, long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Look at the person next to you and say, anything. No one gave him anything. It's interesting because the father was willing to give him everything. But now no one was willing to give him anything. And so, uh, let me rewind that. Hold on one second, everybody. Awkward. Super awkward. And I'm the one speaking. Let's rewind that. Everybody say anything. No one was willing to give him anything. But the father was willing to give him everything. When he came to his senses, I see the notes up there. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robes and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Would you just close your eyes and bow your heads and just pray with me real briefly? Lord, as we jump into your word, I just pray, Father, for the next few moments that, Lord, you would just speak your word and speak your truth to every heart and every individual. Speak to our minds, Lord. Speak to us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just anoint me, Father, to to do what it is you've asked me to do and to communicate what it is that you want me to communicate. I just pray your anointing over me right now in this moment, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Hey, I want you to finish this sentence for me. If mama's not happy, happy. y'all smart, y'all smart. If daddy's not happy, (laughs) nobody cares. Nobody cares if daddy ain't happy. (laughs) That's messed up, man. (laughs) Seriously, that 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 is. I didn't come up with that, by the way. I heard somebody say that, and I thought, wow, that's so funny, you know. But at the same time. It also quite represents what what our culture seems to feel about the insignificance of a father. You know, we live in a culture now where cultural thoughts and views emasculate men. Cultural thoughts and views diminish the role of a father. But how many of you know that the role of a father in the lives of his children are very significant? Can I get an amen? It's God ordained. It's God intended. Fathers or spiritual leaders of their home. You know, in 1960, the United States Census said that about 4% of children were born into fatherless homes. 4%. But in 2020, the census now shows that it's over 50%. 
That is, that is heartbreaking. And for the African American community, the population reads that, I'm sorry, for the African American population, it's even greater at 80% of all African American children are born in a fatherless homes. Nearly every mass shooter over the last 20 years has been uh, perpetrated by a fatherless child. There's a gentleman named Lance Nelson uh, from a ministry called Compact Ministries. He did some research in 2018 and it showed that 14 out of the last 15 mass shootings were done by fatherless kids. Not a single person in death row in America today comes from an intact family. And gender identity issues have risen at the rate of fatherlessness in America. Come on, somebody. You cannot tell me that dad's role is insignificant in the lives of his children. Did you know that 63% of youth suicides come from homes where there's, uh, come from fatherless homes? 90% of runaway children come from fatherless homes. 85% of behavioral disorders are coming from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are coming from fatherless homes. And 85% of youth who are in prison are coming from fatherless homes. I know I'm belaboring the point, but I just want you to understand, Dad, you play a significant role in the lives of your children. And I know that Father's Day means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Maybe today, Father's Day brings feelings of great joy and celebration to you because you have the best dad in all of the world. Like you got him a shirt, right? It says, it says, dad bod. Best dad, <laughs> something like that in the back, right? I thought that was funny. But you have the best dad in the world. And for you, that brings up great feelings and great joy. But for some of us, that's not always the case. Some of us had had present fathers, but they weren't the best fathers. They were physically present, but they were emotionally absent. Some were physically present, but they were physically abusive. Some were verbally abusive, and Lord forbid, in a room this size, in a room this size, some of us may have even experienced sexual abuse of some sort in the hands of a, a father. I understand that not everybody feels the same way about Father's Day. Some of us, Father's Day brings feelings of sadness because we mourn the loss of our father. For some of us, all it does is remind us of the broken relationships that we have with our Father. For many years, it reminded me of the void in my life of a father. I'm 35 years old, and I was two months from t turning 34 before I met my dad for the first time. But I just remember growing up as a kid, always just wishing and hoping that one day I would meet my dad. You know, being... Growing up in the father's long home is, is really, really difficult to describe. You, you got to kind of have to go through it. Maybe there's some of you in this room this morning, and you know what I'm talking about, to grow up without your dad. I just wondered all the time. I had questions in my life. Why, 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 why doesn't he love me? Why doesn't he reach out to me? Does, you know, am I not good enough? You just go through life, you're asking these questions. You, you go through life, you know, just feeling insecure and unprepared because you didn't have a dad there to guide you, a coach, or a teacher. You look to other friends or you look to other men to learn how to do things that you know your dad's supposed to teach you. My friend's dad taught me how to change a tire. My friend, when he was 14 years old, and I was 14 years old, taught me how to tie a tie. You just go through life, and every little thing kind of just reminds you that, of the void that you have growing up without a father, especially in the African-American community when you're growing up, and you see that, not only is your dad absent, but a lot of other dads are absent. But man, all I ever wanted to do was know my dad. I just wanted to know, you know, his personality. I just wanted to know his character. I wanted to know his voice. I wanted to hear him laugh. I wanted to see how he looked. I wanted to know where these good looks came from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I said that during the first service, and my wife sat in the, my wife sat in the very front during the first service. I said that joke. 
And like, y'all, she was the loudest. She's like, ah, ha, 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 good looks. Ha, 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 ha. I'm like, you're laughing a little too hard. You understand you said I do, right? It's too late to say I don't. I hope you, oh, man, okay. I just, I just wanted to know my dad, but I, I found comfort in knowing that our Heavenly Father, the Bible says, is a father to the fatherless. So even though I didn't have my earthly father present, I knew that I had a heavenly father present. And I pray that for some of you, that brings a certain level of comfort. God intended you to have your earthly father. And maybe he's not there to fill the void, but I want you to know that no matter how good your dad was, your earthly dad is, or no matter how lousy your earthly dad is, neither one of them could compare to the love and the kindness and the goodness of your heavenly father. And so today, I want to just share with you three things that you need to know about your heavenly father. Three things that you need to know about your heavenly father. The first thing I, I want you to know about your heavenly father is this, that his heart is filled with love and compassion for you. His heart is filled with love and compassion for you. It says, about, it says, verse 20 says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. I love how that verse begins because it says that while he was still a far way off, a long way off. Has anybody ever felt a long way off? I don't want, I want to show of hands. Anybody ever felt a long way off? Ever felt a long way off to, to being a perfect dad or, or a perfect husband or a perfect mother or a perfect daughter? Ever felt a long way off from, from being who God called you to be, doing what God called you to do, living the life that you know God intended for you to live? Ever felt far off? I, I don't know about you, but I, I have felt a long way off. Pastor Weston is not here. I don't, I don't, I don't see him uh, in the front like I did in the first service. But, but I looked at Pastor Weston. I said, Pastor Weston, because he was my youth pastor. Well, not really, because I'm older than him, but I was a youth leader under Pastor Weston. And I looked at him, and I said, Pastor Weston, do you remember when I was a long way off? And, I mean, this dude was exaggerating. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. But the beautiful thing is that we serve a father, a heavenly father, who sees us a long way off. And when he sees us returning, he doesn't scold us. He doesn't rebuke us. He doesn't condemn us. Instead, his heart is filled with so much love and compassion towards us that he runs our way to embrace us, to take us back. You know, that's the love of a father, a heart full of love and compassion. And let me tell you, God's love and compassion is like no other. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, God describes himself to Moses. And look at the words that he describes himself with. He goes, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. I find it interesting that when the Lord is revealing himself and his character to Moses, the first word that he uses to describe himself is compassionate. That word in the Hebrew comes from the word ha, 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 I'm sorry, ra, rahim. And used as a noun, it's called rahamim. A little rusty on my Hebrew. Rahamim. And it actually, it's beautiful because it invites us to imagine the picture of, of, of a mother tending to her newborn child. God is saying, my love and my compassion towards my children is like that of a mother towards her newborn. And in Isaiah chapter 49, the Lord says, asks two rhetorical questions that I want us to pay attention to. He says, can a mother forget her nursing child? The imagery there is that of a breastfed baby. God is saying, hey, can this mother forget this child that's so dependent upon her? Can a mother... Can a mother forget this child whose sole, whose sole source of 
of, of sustenance and nourishment is mom. Can she forget this child? Then he asks a second question. He goes, could she, can she feel no love for her, her child that she has born? Could a mommy not feel love for this child that was formed in her womb? Could a mommy not feel love for this child that she births? And we all know that the answer instinctively is no. But look at what God says next. I love it. He goes, but even if that were possible, for a mother to forget her nursing newborn, even if that was possible, for a mom who gives birth to a child to have a heart completely hardened towards an infant, he goes, I would not forget you. I would not forget you. Because his love for us and his compassion for us far exceeds that of a mom for her child. In verse 20, we see the father run towards his son. He was so filled with compassion, so filled with love, that that compassion and that action, that compassion and that love moved him into action. I want you to know that God is the same way. His love and his compassion for you moves him into action. In Mark chapter 14, verse 14, it says that Jesus saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion. So what did he do? He healed the sick. In Matthew 15, verse 32, it says that he saw the multitude and they had been with him for three days and they were hungry and he was moved with compassion. So what did he do? He multiplied the fish and the bread and he fed them. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, there were blind men. Jesus saw them and he was moved with compassion. The Bible says that he restored their sight. And then in Matthew, Mark, forgive me, chapter 1, verse 41, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion towards a leper. So he stretched out his hand and he touched them. This is so beautiful because he touched who no one else was willing to touch. Everyone else was avoiding this man. How many of you know God gets up and close and personal with our mess if we let him? He touched them. Why? Because his heart is filled with love and compassion towards you. And I need somebody to know that today. Your heavenly father's heart is filled with love and compassion towards you. New Hope, if I, if I, just, I, just, need, I just need everybody's eyes towards me real quick. And I, I, by the way, I can't tell if your eyes are not. But, but I need you to hear what I'm about to say. I know that for many of you in this well-discipled church, I know hearing that God's love for you, God's heart for you is filled with love and compassion. I know for some of you that's no new news. That's not new news. It's not revolutionary. If anything, it's, it's repetitive. You've heard that before. But maybe today there's somebody here who's never heard that. And I just want to be the first to let you know the truth about God's heart for you, that it's filled with love and it's filled with compassion. And for those of us who have heard that before, I hope we live like it. I hope we live like it. And that we don't condemn ourselves and beat up on ourselves when, when God's heart and attitude towards us is not of that. The second thing I need you to know about your Heavenly Father. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Pastor Chris. Does that mean I have three minutes left? Forgive Because <laughs> I was about to be like, Letitia, come on up here. Play the organ. <laughs> I was about to put my T.D. Jakes voice on for y'all. Well, the second thing you need to know and the third at the same time uh, is... <laughs> I was about to do it. <laughs> the second thing you need to know is that he graciously forgives. I just needed forgiveness. <laughs> the Lord forgives. But no, seriously, he graciously forgives. I want you to look at chapter 15, verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, quick, bring out the best robe. Put it on him. Put rings on his finger. Sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf. Kill it. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. My son was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost. And now, it's, now he's found. Let's have a party. You see how quickly the father forgives? doesn't condemn him, doesn't scold him, doesn't punish him, doesn't do it. Immediately, 
he forgives. First John, verse chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I need somebody to know your heavenly Father graciously forgives. It's not a matter of whether or not he's willing to forgive. We, we've seen what he did on the cross for Jesus. The question is, are you willing to accept the forgiveness that he makes so readily available for you? Some of us feel like we can't approach the Father or receive his forgiveness because, gosh, we're just so unworthy. We messed up so bad. We did something 10 years ago. We did something a few months ago. We did something last week or last night. It's just so sinful that surely God, God can't forgive us. But I want you to know that's not, that's not true. The Lord graciously forgives whenever our hearts repent and whenever we humbly approach him. The Bible says he is just and will faithful and just and will forgive. I want to say this one thing. Some of us need to just forget about our past. Forget about what happened. Forget about what occurred. Just, just, just let it go. Just let it go. Let it die. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody needs to hear this. You need to let your past die. Because if you don't, your past won't let you live. You need to let your past die because if you don't, your past won't let you live. You're going to spend the rest of your life wandering the wilderness, worried about things that happened so long ago, allowing things to define you that God doesn't even hold against you, preventing you from your future, limiting what God can do in your future. I heard an old evangelist preacher, you know, one of those guys who got fire in them. I heard him say like this, when God wants to do something in your future, he's not consulting your past. What happened in the past does not limit God from doing something in your future. Come on, somebody. He graciously forgives. And the last thing I want to I want to say is that it's this. He he lovingly restores. I'm looking for Pastor Letitia. I uh Pastor Letitia, could you help me? Could you please help me help me out if you'll you know what? I'm your older brother. Hey, get up on here and go play that piano. <laughs> Talking to you like Letitia, hurry up. <laughs> He, loving, <laughs> he lovingly restores. He lovingly restores. If you'll think back on the parable with me for a few moments, it says that the, the son went up to the father and he asks for his inheritance, committing this great sin. And then afterwards, he packs up all of his things and he leaves his father's house, creating this distance between him and his father. And then it says that he went, off to a, he went to a far off land and he wasted all the inheritance that his father gave him. I just want you to see a progression. At first there's sin, then there's separation, then there's squandering. He sins against his father. He leaves and creates separation. Then there's squandering. That's always the progression of sin. Sometimes we're squandering our money. Sometimes we're squandering our peace of mind. Sometimes we're squandering our time. Sometimes we're squandering our talents. Sometimes we're squandering our sexuality. Sometimes we're, we're, we're squandering our peace. But sin always leads us to separation and squandering. There's actually a Jewish ceremony that was performed for a young man who would waste his father's inheritance but yet desires to come back and to be in community. It's called kazaza. They would take a pot and just break it in front of them. I thought of doing that as a sermon illustration, you know, but I didn't want y'all to think I was angry. <laughs> and throw it and break it in front of them. And then the community would say, you are cut off. Because the sin was so appalled. They were so appalled by the sin that they would cut this man off and reject him. And so scholars say that the reason that the father ran towards his son, yes, because his heart was filled with love and compassion towards him, but also because he was actually trying to get to the son before the people can get to the son. He was trying to protect his son. And so as a Pharisee or teacher of religious law, you're hearing this and you are shocked because you know what the son deserves. He deserves rejection. 
But what does the Father give him? Restoration. I want you to know that your heavenly Father, his heart is filled with love and compassion for you. He graciously forgives. But more importantly, listen, he longs to lovingly restore you into right relationship with him. I want you to know that's available for you today. And so would you just for a few moments close your eyes all across this room? Maybe today you're not in a relationship with the Lord or in the right relationship with your heavenly Father. Everybody's eyes closed. No one's paying attention. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to come up, but I am going to ask you to raise your hand right where you are because I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? You go, hey, I'm not in the right relationship. Thank you with my heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you. I see hands all over this place. Thank you. Thank you. Before I pray for you, I hope that you let those thoughts from God's word sink in. He loves you. He forgives you. He wants to restore you. Lord, I pray for each and every individual whose hands are lifted. Lord, they're longing to be back in right relationship with you. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, whatever has to happen for them to be back in relationship with you will happen or will occur. As a matter of fact, I don't know where you are right now, but would you just repeat after me if, if at this moment you just want to surrender your life to the Lord one more time. Dear Jesus, I want to be back in my Father's house. I want to receive my Father's love. I want to be restored. And I know it's through your forgiveness. So, Lord, I put my faith in you. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And then I want to do this, if, if you will. You know, Pastor Chris is being so gracious. If you're, if you're a man and you're 21 years or older, right? This, this has to happen quick, people, okay? If you're a man and you're 21 years or older, could you just make your way to the front row briefly? Just fill these altars. Come on, man. We got to move like men. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Come on. When it's time to get ready for church, you tell your wife, move faster. <laughs> it's our turn. Just fill these altars. Fill these altars. Come on, make space, man. Get close. Make space. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to pray over you. Would everybody else behind them, would you stand up and stretch your hands towards them? I want to pray for you. Pastor Chris, if I could invite you to come up on stage with me as well. I want to pray for them, and I'd like you to pray, Pastor. And would you just close your eyes and lift your hands? Right there where you are, would you just start praying? Just for a few moments. God, I thank you for these men. I thank you for these warriors. I thank you for these leaders. I thank you for these spiritual head of the house. Lord, I thank you for their presence. I thank you, Lord, for their provision. I thank you for their sacrifice. I thank you, God, that, Lord, they represent you to their children and you to their wives, Lord, as they surrender themselves to you and follow your will. God, I pray right now, Father, that before we were fathers ourselves. We were sons. And Lord, I'm praying right now that in this moment that these fathers would receive sonship, that they would receive sonship, Lord, and that no matter what level of responsibility they have, no matter what pressures are on them, no matter how heavy the weight of the world is on their shoulders, God, I pray that right now all of that would be released. All of that would be surrendered into the arms of their father. As their family depends on them, God, I pray at this moment, Lord, they would depend on you for everything. In Jesus' name. Would you just stay in his attitude? I want Pastor Chris to just pray over you. The one thing that stands out in my mind today that Pastor Melvin preached 
is I believe until we discover who God created us to be, those whom we have influence with and over will never discover who God created them to be. So with our hands open, Father, right now, I just pray in the name of Jesus that there would be a restoration of identity within the men of this church specifically. God, let there be a restoration of sonship, not a spirit of fear, not a spirit of pride, not a spirit of arrogance, but God, a spirit of sonship, not a spirit that would cause us to be emotionally driven with the waves and the winds of doubt or discouragement or frustration, but God, a spirit of sonship that would cause us to bring stability to this house and all of the houses represented in this altar. In the name of Jesus, I plead a, a, a refreshing of the things that we've taken for granted. God, I pray a refreshing of the things that we've heard our entire lives. God, I pray a refreshing of the identity that you desire for us to walk in. And ultimately, that the identity affects the actions and the actions affect the attitude of the next generation. God, I pray the rising of spiritual fathers in this circle right now. God, that they would come in and they would be what you desire to be that somebody else is not being. God, I pray, I pray in the name, as sons discover who you created them to be, I pray a rising of whether we have biological children or not God I pray a spirit of fatherhood across this worship center right now I pray a spirit of fatherhood for every man of God listening in online right now and God I pray that we would simply walk in the steps that you have anointed for us to walk established for us ordered for us to walk in and that we would just simply look like Jesus to this generation if you receive it say I receive it in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we give God praise all across this place today?